So this was a great excuse to follow up a little bit on the Darwin's Legacy exhibit to take another kind of scientific theory and talk about how it ties into the visual arts. Um, and so the term fight or flight is probably familiar to most of you just as a common uh, phrase that we use, but it was coined in the early 1900s by a Harvard professor to describe um, that immediate reaction that you have when, when you're confronted with a threat, you either stay and fight or you run away as fast as you can. Um, so this being like that, that moment of uh, intense adrenaline, um, a moment of decision is also a great uh, subject for works of art because it's a high intensity, action filled kind of moment, um, full of drama, etc. And so we started off with that kernel of an idea and then we branched out to talk about um, different kinds of motion and how you convey motion in art. So we branched out from that fight or flight moment into other ways of thinking about how animals move. So we'll talk about that in a little, in a little while. Um, the three main sections are motion, which is in this gallery, fight or flight, which is in that gallery, and then just flight, which is also in that gallery. And there's some intermingling of species, of animals and motions as you go throughout. Um, there's a little subsection of water over here. Um, there's a little section of aggression over here. Um, and then there's sort of different ways of moving or different motions over in that uh, corner. But what's uh, a great thing from our collection, um, I wish we had some cave art in our collection, but we don't, um, or some petroglyphs. Um, so what's interesting is that even when the first artists were depicting animals, they tried to depict motion, and they did it in two principal ways. One is that you can see this picture of the rhino with, like, eight horns, because he's, they're indicating that the, his head is moving up and down. It's a way of um, depicting an animal so that you get the sense that it's moving. And then the other way is to depict a herd of animals in all different stages of what motion they're making. Um, so that's two kind of classic ways that artists depicted motion for centuries, thousands and thousands of years. Um, it took photography at the end of the 1800s to really be able to stop the motion and tell you precisely what an animal is doing at different stages of their gait. Um, and this series of photographs came about uh, as a bet between uh, Leland Stanford, who is the founder of Stanford University, and Edward Moybridge, a uh, great photographer. There was a bet that was going on as to whether when a horse was trotting, did its foot ever leave the ground. And so through Edward Moybridge's photographs, uh, they start off with horses in different uh, running, trotting, walking, etc., taking these amazing photographs of every stage of their gait. And one method of doing that was setting up uh, however many, 16 cameras, and having the horse or the animal run through a series of trip wires that would trip the shutter on the camera. So that would take you know, 16 cameras taking one photo um, at a time, and then you composite it together, and you get this, uh, this way of depicting an animal in motion. So prior to this, you see a lot of this kind of thing, which is a depiction of animals running, and this is at full gallop with their feet out in front of them and their back legs back behind them. And you can see that in some of these cave depictions. This was the commonly accepted way of depicting an animal in motion, especially horses like in a carriage. You would see them in this funny like hobby horse kind of motion. And it's funny to us because we know that that's not really what they do, but it wasn't funny to people of the time. That's how you did it. So this is really interesting from our collection from the late 1800s, um, showing that he probably did not see Moybridge's work. And then this is really fun, painting by Albert Bierstadt, where he's doing a motion study of a caribou. Um, and I think it's debatable in this whether he had seen the work of Moybridge or not. So that's something that you could, you might be able to find a series of caribou photos by Moybridge to see if Bierstadt was copying something. Um, but anyway, there are two different ways of depicting motion um, that represent ways uh, that people were doing it 
before and at the time of Moybridge's work. So this is in our collection, and we haven't brought it out in a long time, if ever. Um, some of that, I don't know if it's been out for a while. Some of these sculptures haven't been out ever, and I'll try to point those out as we go um, through. So this is kind of the setup for the whole thing, and then we'll just walk around um, slowly and talk about different, okay. different areas. Alan, can you explain the bed again? Is it all feet are off the So ground? when trotting, did all of the horse's feet okay. leave the ground? Because I think that you could see when a horse was galloping that certainly all of its feet left the ground, but you just couldn't tell where they were. But trotting, you know, is a different kind of motion, and that was the bet. And I honestly can't remember, right, I can't remember the outcome of that bet. Another thing to Google. Um, so, we wanted to do a little bit of a, a little section of maybe a pre-flight or flight uh, moment where you were, you know, about to be the uh, object of aggression. So that bear seems to me like he's always on the verge of doing something. This rhino is looking like he's going to charge. That rhino is really charging at you. Do you really think this uh, one's charging? I thought he looked happy. I think to me that that's the, at the moment where he's really thinking about whether he's going to charge at you or not. But that's my own interpretation. Yeah, he's, he's, looking at he's moving, he's, he's so looking at you. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, it's open to interpretation. Um, Charging, 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 about to do something. You can say that. Um, this sculpture by Dylan Lewis maybe has never been out before. South African uh, sculptor, uh, living artist. Uh, that sculpture of a rhino has never been out by Jonathan Kenworthy, uh, an older generation, but also a living artist. He lives in uh, England. He's a very famous uh, animal sculptor of the same generation as Ken Bunn. And then this guy, many of you may have met him when he was here for Western Visions, is Robert Glenn, another uh, South African. And these are three giraffe running. And what I love about this sculpture and that sculpture is that this is another way of showing animals in motion. You just depict many of them doing different stages of the gait. So you can think of this as three different animals, which is a great way to think of it. But you could also think of it as the same animal in three different poses as they make their way through a motion. And that is definitely true here, or this is the beginning of the leap, and this is the end of the leap. And you can see how the whole thing works by looking at these two animals. And so what they do, this is a more realistic way uh, of painting that motion, but here's another take on it, which is really interesting too. And this painting has never been out by uh, Ted Waddell, who many of you know from those like buffalo herd paintings or cow herd paintings. This takes an idea from the cave paintings, but also from a group of painters called the Futurists, who were working in Italy in the early 1900s. Who were, these uh, Futurists were trying to convey the dynamism, the activity of urban and uh, modern life. And so this guy, this is the, probably the most famous one, this dog has hundreds of feet and bunches of tails and the lady's feet are moving really fast and that was a way that they sort of rediscovered to convey motion and art. And then this beautiful painting, you can see that the trunk, he's indicated the motion of the trunk here in the same kind of fashion. So it just shows you sort of the durability of um, these ways of depicting animals in action. And uh, Ted Waddell called this Hemingway's dream in part because Hemingway uh, went to Africa and has some really great books that he wrote about Africa. Uh, the other pieces in here, we have a bunch of Bob Coons, as you'll notice, because Bob Coon was a master at conveying action. Not very many uh, people are that good at it. We brought that Rungus painting out, in part because Rungus really became known for these static portraits of moose in you know, beautiful undergrowth and did not do very many motion studies, but this is an interesting picture for him of caribou uh, moving out. And then the, this is sort of just a variety. There's rolling around, there's butting heads, taking off. Um, swimming is pretty self-evident, self or water. Um, this great turtle sculpture hasn't been out for a long time by Kent Oliver. Nice 
caribou swimming, penguins about to jump in the water, this beautiful pastel, which people often think is a photograph, uh, by Paul Bosman, of a swimming elephant. Beautiful fish, we don't have a lot of fish in the collection. And then this great painting that depicts both flight and swimming, um, which is a great little horse piece. So, go in here, unless anybody has any questions in this room. Hi. Well, later, artists used that. Right, artists did use that Moybridge book because it had pictures of all kinds of different mm -hmm. animals in all kinds of different poses. However, there was a story like eight years ago that I remember that said that people still like get that motion wrong. And so part of that is always, are you painting something that's convincing to your audience to show motion or are you doing a scientific rendering, you know? And so mm -hmm. it's debatable which way you, should, which you can go. On that, um, this painting's never been out. It's uh, painted by Bruno Lillefors, um, who really prided himself on going out into nature, as you know, and studying wildlife in the field. And this is a great depiction of the flight and the well. The these guys are flying, obviously, and then this guy's fleeing. And it also, you can think of this in that terms that we were just talking about in terms of having two birds, but depicting two different parts of a motion. So this guy's coming in, but he's going to follow this guy, so eventually he'll be kind of in that position, presumably. What year is this? A couple of years ago, but then the frame was restored, and so this was the original frame, and it, had, it took a while to get it restored. Um, it came from auction in Sweden. Are those hawks? Uh, they're what we call sea eagles. So they look like, to me, like a relative of the golden eagle. And that, go after that is an eider duck. Yeah, I thought that they went after fish. Do they go after ducks? If he painted it, then they did it. <laughs> uh, Complementing that, of course, is our sculptures by Antoine Louis Barry, who was famous for these battle scenes. Um, and he did not go out into nature to study animals. He went to the zoo in Paris and made these things up out of his imagination. Um, but that doesn't make them any less successful works of art. So we've got fighting, we've got fleeing, then again, then we have a little rabbit section over here, which was fun to put together. Uh, Bob Coon, so we've got two of his classic coyote and uh, rabbit paintings in this exhibit. Um, this piece by Ernest Thompson Seton, of this bunny jumping straight up in the air, which also apparently happens. And this great sculpture of these two bunnies boxing, which again is another natural <laughs> behavior in the middle of fighting. Um, these two sculptures over here have never been out. This, they're uh, of the same era, and I think when you look at them, you can think of they they maybe because I know when they were done, they kind of say 1970s to me. But um, they, this was a style of sculpture, obviously, that both Ken Bun and Jonathan Kenworthy were experimenting with. Um, this dynamic, really amazing uh, series of of actions that really is the moment where the animals have made that fight or flight decision, especially in that one, I feel like. Um, and something that arguably you can do much better in bronze than you can do in painting, because you've got all the dimensionality to, to, to work with. You can capture these motions uh, very dramatically. And so we we're really happy to be able to get these out. And then this classic uh, Bob Coon painting depicts uh, the cat who's just like reached out and grabbed that egret and his friends have flown off, but he is not so. <laughs> I always love this painting too because this is something that you might not have ever seen it, but it could happen right out on the elk refuge. Both of those creatures are out there. Um, it might, might someday happen. Um, artists love to depict flight, I think. Because it speaks to something inside us as something that we will never really be able to do, you know, unless we do genetic engineering and grow wings. Um, but it's just one of those things where you can imagine yourself up there in the air, um, and how you depict flight is also very interesting. There's been many ways of doing that over the years. Um, so we have a, a great number of uh, flight uh, paintings and sculptures. Um, this one, called Courtship Flight by George Carlson, depicts the 
uh, birds mating in air and falling out of the air as they, as they do. Um, so there's also, in addition to flight, different things that happen in midair, different midair interactions. This is another thing that you might see right outside the museum. This is not something that you'd see outside the museum, but it's a really great uh, depiction. And I don't know why, but this one always seems to me uh, very surreal, because just the way that they're up there with no background, um, and just the way they're positioned um, in midair, having this weird interaction, just is both bizarre and, I don't know, out of the ordinary surreal. But Ray Harris Ching, famous British artist, incredible, uh, incredibly skilled, but then also incredibly imaginative with hands like this. Um, Carl Brender, so this is a nice contrast between somebody who's using like airbrushes and being really, really super meticulous, and then somebody who's capturing the same anatomy and the same kind of action, but in a little bit different way. Does anybody remember when Robert Bateman was here and he talked about this sculpture? Mm -hmm. yeah. if, uh, so I need to check this, but my recollection was he says that this was something that would never happen outside of a zoo. <laughs> because this is a New World bird, a parrot or a macaw, and this is an Old World monkey. So we know that Bugatti and Colan and those guys were all studying creatures at the uh, zoo in Antwerp. Um, and so not necessarily basing their models on things they saw in the wild. And so I just loved that story uh, when he told it. And that was a long, long time ago. Um, 10, 15, 12 years ago. Yeah. He was here again. He was here later. Because I didn't get here until 2000. 2002 or something? Uh, anyway. But uh, Bronwyn reminded me when we got this out that what they're going after is this little nut in the bird's beak. So don't forget to look for that or point it out. So these are two paintings by Joseph Wolf, and in one you could say like this is a really convincing depiction of that fight or flight moment. The eagle's coming down, he's attacking the fawn presumably, and the deer are ready to either strike him or run away. And then this one's always been really funny to me. He's really trying to depict that moment when the bird comes in and grasps the fish, but it always looks like the bird is risen like straight out of the water like this. Um, and so you could say this is a less successful depiction of that. But again, pre-camera uh, pre or right at the beginning of camera technology, pre-photography, um, he's out there trying to depict these things that later things like film would but be so at least he's holding it in the proper way. Right, he's got the fish. Yeah. So Joseph Wolf was really, he, yeah. he knew his stuff, but he getting this motion was difficult, clearly. Um, two nice paintings by him. We'll come back to this. Uh, these are more of that way of depicting motion through various stages using different animals. And I really like the shots because it gives you... Uh, the, the sense of motion by using blurry winged edges, that they're all moving around. Um, but in contrast to that, I also really love this because it's accurate depictions of each stage of these birds coming down and then tilting up their wings so that they can slow down enough to land in the water. Bateman's using the blurry wing thing here again. And then this beautiful work came out of Western Visions this year by Andrew Denman um, and shows... Uh, Again, like a sense of motion through the bird, but then these silhouettes of the bird above and below it. And then we decided to bring out three of these Sam Easterson videos. As you recall, five years ago, we might maybe had um, an installation of eight of these in the members' uh, gallery. And he is really be well known for this, mounting a camera on an animal's head, so you can see the world from their perspective. And of course they never stand still, so you're getting all the motion, but the animal is sort of helping the artist depict it in this case, rather than the artist just depicting the animals doing it. Um, so we decided to bring three of these out for this show as a way to show you uh, what a modern uh, artist is doing and it's a nice tie-in with that Moybridge uh, photograph. 
So, that is the quick uh, rundown. Just thinking about the Sandy Scott Eagle down at the south end of the parking lot mm -hmm. down there, when she unveiled it, we asked her, is this eagle flying, taking off, or landing? Mm -hmm. And she said, all of the above. <laughs> she said, I tried to put it all into one simple sculpture. Yeah. Which, you know, make, makes me think of tying into this. Right. That is interesting. And it's also interesting, in terms of flying, maybe that's a little harder yes. to depict in sculpture, because you have to have some support for it, like the back of that courtship plate. Um, whereas we were talking about earlier, for the other land-based animals, they're always going to have something connected to the ground. So, uh, it's a little bit easier to depict that intense kind of motion. So Jane, are you going to talk about yep. the interpretive stuff? And I'm going to, so I will start, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Edward Boybridge, because he mm -hmm. ties in so well. Adam gave a great introduction to him, but let's go back in here, and I want to make a connection to what he's done in this story with some of the things we have on the table, and then Grace will be talking more about the table. And then uh, Carrie will be talking about some of the other interpretive labels that we have in the exhibit. But as Adam pointed out, there's still photographs of the bison and the Boybridge. But the popular, popularly debating question really had to do um, with the gallop. Also with the trot, but mostly with the gallop, they weren't sure one, if all four legs came off the ground at the same time, and two, if they did, what position they were in when they came off of the ground. And Edward Moybridge, as Adam explained to you, was very eccentric. He was very um, obsessive. He did over 100,000 images of animals in motion to help to solve this mystery, as it were, at the time. And one of the, uh, some of the really interesting techniques, when he lined up those what did you say, 16 cameras, Adam? I think it was, 16 cameras along the track. Keep in mind that they were not cameras like we have today. They were the big tripod, heavy box camera, glass plate negative. You could take one image at a time, and then it, you'd have to take out the glass plate negative and insert another if you wanted another photo. So that was the need for 16 cameras. Um, another difficulty was getting enough light because the cameras then were not as good about registering light as nowadays. So on the track where the horse was running, he set out white bed sheets to reflect the light up so you really got a good look at what was happening with the feet. And when those 16 images were all um, developed, then he put them in a uh, kind of a flipbook style of animation to really see what was going on. It was called a zoopraxis scope. It was similar to the zoetrope that we have on the table that Grace is going to tell you about. Vicki Atwater, I don't think she's here today, but she came to the sneak peek we had. She had just come back from the museum at Stanford University where they have a zoopraxis scope made from parts of, of the you know, antique ones from that time period. Mm -hmm. And she said you could look in it and turn the crank, and then you get that animation. And another interesting tie-in is um, on, the, on the table over here, we have his of the trotting horse, his images made into a flip book. It, it's similar to the, the, the zoopraxis scope that he used was similar. I mean, basically, it's a way of animating still photos and seeing what happens. So when you pick this up and you see the horse in full gallop, there is a moment of course, when the legs all come off the ground at the same time, which settled that debate. In the gallop. And it's in the gallop. Yeah. And when you look around the corner here at Bob Kuhn's mm. pronghorn running, you yeah. can see that he had that, Bob Kuhn, of course, had that knowledge. And he shows the pronghorn in a gallop, their legs are tucked underneath. So that moment when all four legs come off the ground, or when the legs are tucked underneath, not when the legs are stretched out stretched in front yeah. and in back. So that kind of solved solve that question for people. Um, also, I pulled this from the, from the animation station table. Three of the strips, I think it's three, um, Carrie can correct well, there me. Might even be more. There might be more. But three of the strips I think that we have out on the table are direct derivations of Edward Moybridge's still photographs. Mm -hmm. So this is the horse galloping, and Carrie has very handily put on the back this strip 
based on original photography by Edward Whitebridge. So it's this one, the, the acrobats, the and the tiger the hat, running, and, and then the dance. dancing couple. So four that we have on the table here. You can, when you talk about him here, you can go show people the zoo, zooscope. And then <laughs> there are all these different types, they're yeah. slightly different names <laughs> of these circular mo animation motion devices from that time period. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna have Grace talk about the table in just a moment, but one more Edward Moybridge story, if you get people who are interested in him. Some of you may remember Colleen Fitzgerald, who was one of our summer interns a few years ago. She wrote her master's thesis on Edward Moybridge, and she was in this past Thursday night at Mixed Media giving a tour. And you can, Carrie's gonna tell you more about these hack tours we've been experimenting with in this exhibit. But she uh, was really excited to see that we were doing some interpretation about him. It gave her a chance to tell some of her stories. So one more Edward Moybridge story that's a nice kind of follow-up to the, to the one about how he captured these still photographs. And it has to do with, he was, so he was an Englishman. He came to this country as a young man um, and was uh, living in San Francisco. He had an antiquarian book selling business. And in 1860, he was getting ready to go back to England to get some antiquarian books to bring back for his shop in San Francisco, and he missed the book. So back then, it wasn't as simple, you know, when you miss an airplane, it's a little complicated, but you book yourself on the next airplane, usually it's the same day. Well, he missed the boat, he consulted with whoever was his travel expert, and the, the Next logical thing for him to do, which actually wasn't very logical, but he was decided to do it. The next, next fastest way to get transport to England was to get on a stagecoach in San Francisco, go the southern route to St. Louis, in St. Louis connect with the railroad station where he was going to catch a train to New York and then get on a boat. So this is what he set out to do, and it was a you know, difficult passage. So he's on this stagecoach going the southern route on his way to St. Louis when there was an accident. The stagecoach, coach, there was a runaway horse accident. Um, every single passenger was ejected from the stagecoach. One died, everybody was injured. Edward Moybridge himself, when he was ejected from the stagecoach, hit his head on a rock and was unconscious had to be taken a couple hundred miles to Arkansas for the nearest treatment, and then he eventually made, got back to New York, where he was then brought to England for, to follow up on his treatment. But he, it was a very serious head injury. He was never the same after that. He started his photography after the head injury because his doctor in England said, you've got to change your career profession, it's great if you could be outside. Why don't you take up photography? Because um, I think you can handle that better. So that was when he took up photography. But his friends said he was never the same after that. In fact, there's a whole other story involving his wife, which is pretty crazy, but indicates the extent of his head injury. And he was, uh, so 12 years after this accident, he married a woman named Flora Shalcross Stone. And she was uh, two years into her marriage to Moybridge, uh, he discovered that his young wife had been having an affair with a drama critic who was well, well known at the time. His name was Major Harry Larkins. And there was a question as to which of the two men fathered her seven-month-old son named Florado, nicknamed Claudie. <laughs> so Edward tracked down Major Larkins at his home, and when Larkins answered the door, Edward Moybridge's um, is reported to have said, good evening, Major, my name is Moybridge, and here's the answer to the letter you sent my wife, and he shot him point blank and oh. killed him. Then there was a whole um, trial that ensued, and his lawyer took the insanity plea because they had four of his friends testifying that he was never the same after this, and he was, you know, very emotional, and he was very... Um, uh, what's the other word? Dra the accident dramatically changed his personality, impetuous, emotional. Um, but Moybridge at the trial, so they had all these great, you know, people testifying on his behalf that he really was insane. 
But Moybridge undercut his own insanity plea uh, by saying his actions were deliberate and premeditated. <laughs> he also, at the trial, showed impassive indifference and un uncontrolled explosions of emotion. The jury dismissed the insanity plea, probably because he wrecked it, but they acquitted Moybridge on the grounds of justifiable homicides, disregarding the judge's instructions. So kind of a crazy story, but gives you a, a little bit of insight into who he was and may, perhaps why he was so obsessive in going after these types of photographs that you know, no one before him had, had taken this on and he was determined he was going to solve this mystery and figure it out. So, so did he do that after he shot the man? After. Oh, after. Oh, that's a good question. Was, when did he, was he involved in the photography? I, we'd have to look that up. We can check on that. There it doesn't matter. Yeah. But he definitely took up the photography after the head injury. And he stayed in England. He didn't go back to the States. He did come back to the States. Uh, after his treatment, lengthy treatment in England, came back to the States, got involved at Stanford University, as Adam was telling us, and with these uh, images of the animals in motion. Okay, so Grace is now going to talk to us a little bit more about the animation station. So yeah. while many, so while this exhibition is primarily about the animal response of the fight or flight, um, the idea of putting a, an image into motion is what we branched our um, in gallery interpretation on. So I'll pass this around. We have several different samples of flipbooks tethered here to the table, um, including the Moybridge one that Jane just showed you, and there are a couple more. Um, and we have asked visitors to take a flip book and make their own. This person has done oh, a little bit. As you can see, there are many pages, so it depends on how long you want it. But people are allowed to take these home. They draw from inspiration of um, the pieces that we have already on the table. And then also we have, um, this is not a vintage zoetrope, but it's a recreation. Um, and as Jane said, we have different samples that came with it that have images in which you can see an image in motion. And we've also given our visitors an opportunity to make their own on these sheets. Um, so the idea being that each one of the images aligns with an opening in the zoetrope. And we have someone made this strip, and we decided that it was so spectacular. And we'll glue that back down to the table. Um, that we laminated it. So this is sort of like the most awesomest example. Um, so if you want to come over here, and you can see, um, if you get down and look between the uh, slots, that you can see the image actually in the <coughs> Um, so those are two ways that we've allowed visitors to put the image into motion. Um, in addition, we have, you'll notice that there are a couple green labels throughout the gallery space. Yeah, no, um, and so Carrie is going to talk a little bit about those. Um, if you want to. <laughs> I'm happy to. So we've asked people to not only use their their drawing skills, their creativity skills, but also their bodies in motion through the different interpretive labels, and I'll hand that over to you. Perfect, yeah, that's a perfect segue. So as you can see, some of our green labels here are just kind of fun, thought-provoking questions, deep-looking, um, like this one, for instance, which asks you to, you know, visually compare these, these two sculptures and think about process. Um, some of them are a little more physical, physical yes. Um, so for instance, over there we have a prompt that asks you to mimic the caribou that are making their aquatic migration and swim to the next work of art and try and understand, you know, feel how that feels in your body. How does it um, compare to just simply walking? Um, so we have some sort of prompts that ask you to get into your own body a little bit there. Um, the most extreme example of which comes in, um, there are four interpretive labels that have a little um, green square at the top and then have a photo underneath. And that's where we're asking guests um, to really get involved. So each green box has a, has a kind of dynamic movement prompt. So this one over here by this rabbit, for instance, um, asks you to, um, to 
in the spotlight, of course, in the safety oh of the spotlight God. to protect the art, um, to really do a, do a dynamic movement and have someone who has maybe a phone handy. We all have cameras handy nowadays, right? Has a phone handy to snap that picture of you and try to capture you in that moment of that first of action. Um, we also have one over here that asks you and your group to fly together and try and fly in synchrony. Um, plenty of inspiration around to figure out how your bodies would move there to work together as a group. We also have a couple over there that play around with that multi-frame action like you saw in the giraffes or the um, elephant's trunk, um, as well as choosing a pose from one of the animals in the exhibit and holding it as long as you can. <laughs> So we have been playing around with these, um, not only you know, allowing visitors to interact with them on their own, but we've also been piloting um, hack tours. So we've just done one round of them at the last mixed media event. And what a hack tour is, is a quick 15 minute, kind of goofy, kind of outrageous exhibit tour that um, plays around with some of those interpretive elements. Um, you know, maybe we're not doing deep looking at every work of art, but we're really trying to, um, I don't know, maybe turn, turn a traditional tour on its head a little bit and ask people to really kind of be goofy and funny and, and, and let go and ask questions and interpret the works for themselves. Um, so the people that are, and the, the thing with the hack tours is the folks that are leading these tours are community members. So instead of folks who have extensive training like yourself, we're asking people to come in, we're providing them some training and background, and then asking them to really lead a quick, funny, wild tour um, that you know, shares the facets of the exhibit that are most interesting to them. So in our hack tours for this gallery, which were very successful and we're hoping to keep growing the program, it was just a little experiment so far, but um, we definitely incorporated these movement prompts, um, incorporated the zoetrope. So um, yeah, that's been a lot of fun and it's been a, it's been a great experiment in the space, which is all about dynamism, um, to really you know, bring that into the visitor experience as well. And I'll jump in with the hack tours. They're especially geared towards millennials. Yes. So some of the studies that have been done by others who are offering these tours say that that, young, that younger generation, they're not engaged with museums. And this is a way to try to engage with them in a way that they're interested in, in engaging. Yeah. Um, Incorporating some tours. social media and things like that, maybe getting the conversation started on a different note. So that was why I didn't give a hack tour at Mixed Media. I'm too old. <laughs> so it's millennials giving tours to other millennials is what it's about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, unless you, either of you has anything to add, does anyone have any questions about the words, the interpretive strategies? All right. Well, in that case, um, I think we can wrap it up. We can, some of us can hang around in here, but otherwise we'll start getting that food.